I'd like to welcome you to uh, our midweek service here at Ararat. Um, either, <coughs> excuse me, if you're here this morning or if you're watching us online later. I hope this Easter has been a real blessing to you. Um, and as you've spent time perhaps reflecting on the, the central message or perhaps as you've spent time meeting up with family and friends or just relaxing together. I must admit that one of the pleasurable things that I, I did over, over the Easter holidays was to spend some time walking in the shallows of the beach at Gower and talking with my husband. I like that, just walking backwards and forwards, not too far into the water. It's a bit cold still. How many times does God say to us to come along and walk beside him or sit with him a while and share what's on our minds and hearts and listen to what's on his? There's the verse in, in, uh, verses in Matthew chapter 11 that say, and this is in a, a modern translation, are you tired, worn out, burnt out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I love that, the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Let's take a little time to walk along with our Saviour. Let's take a little time to share what's on our hearts and what's on our minds and listen to what's on his. Let's quieten ourselves and meet with God. Let's pray. We thank you for this time, Lord, to come away from the busyness of the day. We ask you, Lord, to take the distractions away, the things that are buzzing around our heads, and help us to just walk a while with you, sit a while with you. We ask you, Lord, to help us to put down some of those masks that we wear, some of those cloaks we put over our true feelings. We ask you, Lord, to help us to be ourselves with you. And we ask you most of all, Lord, that you will speak your love, your truth, and your peace into our hearts. Dear God, you are the way, the truth, and the life. And we need those things. So we ask you now, Lord, to lift our eyes to you, open our ears to you, and open our hearts to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first hymn is one, it's a beautiful one. I love uh, both the melody and the words, and they're going to come up on screen now. And it's, I heard the voice of Jesus say,
taken from first of all Matthew chapter 25 and verses 36 to 40 and they'll appear on the screen they're from uh, this is from the parable of the sheep and the goats which you probably know it's just a portion taken out I needed clothes or in one translation, I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did I, we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When do we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go and visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And the second reading is from John chapter 20, verses 19 to 28. Jesus appears to his disciples. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting, believe. Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Thanks be to God for the reading of his word. Let's pray. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we know of all the, the neediness and the problems that there are in the world, the times when we are without, we find ourselves without. We are without the hope that we want, that we would like to have, with, without the material things that we'd like. We look around and see the need that is in our world too. We look around at brothers and sisters who are without. They are without hope. They're without material possessions. They are sick. They are without the freedom that they need. And we pray now, Lord, for your help in these situations. We ask, first of all, Lord, for our freeing our freeing from the things that most oppress us lord you know that there are things in this life that pull us down ways that we live that pull us down and we ask you lord to take charge in our lives of those situations. The things that worry us. The things that cause us fear. The things that cause us anger and grief.
Lord, we know that you love us and that you know that that is not the way that you want us to live, or want us to have abundant life. So we ask now that you will take from us those tensions in our lives. We pray for our brothers and sisters in this country who are struggling with immense pressures just to get by each day. We pray for those that are struggling with difficult relationships. with different oppressions to substances. We pray for those in other countries who are um, suffering from the effects of war, the oppression of uh, other leaders that are trying to um, overrun their country and take their, uh, their civil liberties from them, take their homes from them, take their peace from them. Lord, we ask that you will take charge of your world. We know that you reign, but we ask, Lord, that you will guide us humans who, are, who behave so unwisely so often. Help us, Lord, to live each day aware of how we treat our brothers and sisters. And now we pray together as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I'd like us to listen to um, uh, a little uh, a song called "Love Is the Touch." Um, and it, I know that this this um, sermon has a lot to do with the expression of love and the expression of how God touches us in in His world. Um, it's a beautiful song. I hope you can hear the words from it. Um, but just let's just listen to it for a moment. Touch of intangible joy. Love is the force that no fear can destroy. Love is the goodness we gladly applaud. God is where love is for love is of God. Yeah. 
find yourself uh, surprised by something that is quite familiar, but you look at it from an entirely different angle. And you think, oh, gosh, that's uh, unexpected. I, I didn't expect to see that, or I've no noticed that before. It might be uh, a piece of architecture that you've walked past, or a story that you've heard before over and over again, but you never noticed that detail about it. It might be the origin or the history of a saying that you've used over and over again, but you didn't know that that's where it came from. Or it might be that you never thought in reflecting upon a relationship. For instance, that a carer might be a, like a parent is caring for somebody, but they are also being cared for like a mother for a child. And the mother may also be the the daughter of, of, the, of their mother, just thinking in terms of that. I saw a, a snippet of a counselling session. That sounds a bit odd, doesn't it? A counselling session, but between a, a toddler and a mother. Only it was very strange. It was on, on the internet and it was, this little toddler, can only have been about two, was calming down the mother who was crying just off screen and you could hear the mother crying, was obviously quite distraught. And this toddler was saying, it's all right, it will be all right to open your mouth and breathe. And it was just, it was delightful that this toddler was telling the, the mother how to calm down. And you knew that the toddler would have had it from the mother before, but now they were passing it back. I thought that was lovely. I've had a few instances of it over Easter as well. They might seem quite trivial in some cases, but they all seem to be linked as far as I was concerned. I'm going to offer them to you and we'll try and put them together. First of them, question, what might you regard as a real sign that a leader has a sense of humility and a desire for a close bond with their team. Now, I would say that it's not only the sharing of their vision and their plans with their team, but it's a declaration of his sense of need or his desire for their involvement in carrying it out, that he needs their help. Would you say that? Now, please don't hear me wrong here. I know, <clears throat> I know that it's Jesus who faced the trials. He, he faced the scourging, the mocking, the crucifixion entirely alone. But in his preparation for that task, he specifically and repeatedly asked for his followers' help, both in, in um, setting, symbolically setting out the scene and then in uh, declaring his plan over, through the Passover meal and then facing the anguish of sacrificially lay, laying down his life for the sake of those he loved. Think about it. Do you remember when he sends the two disciples to fetch the donkey's colt for his triumphal entry into Jerusalem? What reason does he tell them to give to the owner of the colt? The Lord needs it. Not wants it or commands it, but needs it. And I just, it's the first time I saw it ever, it's, it's almost oxymoron, isn't it? The Lord needs it. The Lord needy. Then again, what, where does he eat the, the Last Supper? It's in a borrowed upper room. Borrowed. That's the way he always had his hospitality when, when, he, was, when he was staying near Jerusalem. Well, where, where have he went? He received hospitality from Mary and Martha and Lazarus because, as he said elsewhere, the Son of Man, a name for the Messiah, has nowhere to lay his head. He didn't own property. 
Unlike, as he said, the wild foxes. Even the wild foxes have dens, not the Messiah. And when he needs to face that deep, dark anguish of his soul that night in Gethsemane, for who would choose to give up your life? And who would choose to give up the friendships, the relationships that you had built? He takes his closest, dearest friends to watch and pray with him. Come and be alongside me. I'm going through a really hard time now. Come and be with me. Surely the very Lord who taught them how to pray didn't need their company in this. Apparently he did. In fact, he desperately desired it because he asked them for it three times. What does that say about vulnerability? So that's the first thing. Second thing I was surprised over over Easter was listening to a reflection on a podcast in a series of Lent talks. They were on BBC Sounds and I highly recommend them. If you've got a little bit of time and you can listen to a podcast, this one was entitled, I was naked and you clothed me. That's why I, I commented when I when the, did the reading. I should have chosen a different uh, translation. How? I was naked and you clothed me was the title, which many will recognize from those words from the parable and uh, of the sheep and the goats. Now, considering the current desperate situation in Ukraine, and also the needs expressed by a lot of people in this country, economic needs of, you know, you can't manage your uh, daily uh, needs for food and, and clothing for your family. I thought, I wondered whether the podcast might be about uh, helping your neighbor materially. That's what I was kind of expecting. So I was slightly surprised to hear a completely different perspective on the text by an elderly lady who had been the victim of sexual abuse in her earlier years. Now, she spoke very movingly about the effects, consequences of the trauma, and the eventual sense of healing that she had found. And without going into great detail here, there were, I believe, some points that linked back in my mind with what I glimpsed in the Easter texts. The lady, Dr. Margaret Kennedy, spoke about how much we view our clothing or appearance in general as a sort of armor, a sense of protection, of identity, power, determinism. That's how we make our choices. Maybe even exuberance and fun. But that abuse left the victim with a feeling of nakedness, even nakedness irrespective of whether they were stripped of clothes. It didn't matter actually whether clothes were taken off, they, were, they felt naked. I'm going to read you just some of the phrases she used to describe the effects of her of this feeling of nakedness. Even though I know these are hard to hear, but I won't be mentioning anything about violence, so please don't be worried about that. She says, I was naked unable to harm myself, to hide, to stop the onslaught. I had no understanding, no strength, and no way of clothing myself. I felt a layer of skin was ripped from me like Jesus on Good Friday. I had no protection. I didn't know what to do. I froze inert, captive. I felt humiliated, shamed, undone. I felt guilt. I no longer understood the world. I lost trust and confidence. I realized the perpetrators had not only stolen my clothes, but stolen me from me and made me wear something else. My whole sense of the beauty of me vanished. I had been rendered vulnerable, malleable, easy prey. I'd been captured, used, not only bodily, but spiritually and mentally. And you know, as I listened to the list, it felt like I was listening to all the effects of brokenness, evil, and sin on every one of us 
in the world. If you think of all those different things, the loss of identity, I am no longer who I was meant to be. The sense of guilt, shame, loss of trust. How many of us have felt that? Sense of worthlessness, vulnerability, vulnerability to manipulation, <coughs> loss of freedom, pain, loss of understanding. We feel naked because actually it's not only the sexually abused that feel that way, it is the lonely, the sick, the long-term unemployed, often, the bereaved, the economically challenged, these are signs of brokenness. And it suddenly turned the verse, naked you clothe me, right around for me. Surely it's we, the naked ones, who are being clothed by God himself. We're the naked ones. It's not them out there, <coughs> as such, necessarily being clothed by us. We're the naked ones. And how did he do it? By being the one rendered completely naked for us. And as I thought of each one of these onslaughts of evil on mankind... I marveled again at how Jesus bore loss of identity, guilt, shame, fear, betrayal, worthlessness, bullying, pain, bewilderment, humanness. He bore humanness. He opened himself up to vulnerability. He sat beside us in humanity, as he invited us, and this is the marvellous thing, he invited us to sit beside him. Come and participate in this, he said to his disciples. To identify ourselves with him as we stood with him there. So that's the second. Third thing. I was moved again when remembering the scene after the resurrection where Jesus meets with his disciples in the locked room. If you remember, Thomas is not present the first time. I wondered why. Perhaps he had already given up hope of a future when his master had been killed. And if he hadn't before, he probably felt when he didn't appear, when he didn't go to the locked room and be with the other disciples, and then they come out and they say, oh, by the way, did you know... Jesus appeared to us, and he probably thought, oh, now I've really blown it. Uh, I didn't even go there. I wasn't even there with them. He's probably given on, up on me completely. If he ever appeared, he feels broken, lost, bewildered, lacking in understanding. A week later, into that scene again, Jesus comes. And he, what does he do? He turns to Thomas and he points up his wounds. He said, I know you're wounded, Thomas. Here's my wounds. Touch them. I'm wounded too. I know what woundedness is like. Touch them. There's no need to hide your wounds. I'm not, I'm wounded too. But they don't need to define you anymore, Thomas, because... I've overcome them. They didn't overcome me, he said. I've overcome them. I'm alive. You can find life again. Dr. Kennedy, Margaret Kennedy, shared how her friends helped her to reclothe herself, to find her strength and beauty once more, although it took some time. Many who had shared similar experiences to her and the same sort of wounds, but others who hadn't, but who'd simply been determined to sit beside her, to soak up some of the painful times and affirm her as she found her resurrection. 
So I suppose that the verse, naked you clothe me, may be viewed from two perspectives that are intimately interwoven. It's Christ who has reclothed us, identifying fully and sitting with us in our wounded human condition, in all its vulnerability, in order to restore us to freedom, strength and beauty. By his wounds we are healed. And in the same way, he calls us to use our own healed wounds to mirror the same sacrificial love and care, to sit a while with and help to reclothe our wounded brothers and sisters. And that's what I want to leave with you. That kind of, it's a sort of a one and the other. And our final hymn, with that thought in mind, is another John Bell and Graham Moore song. That previous one was. It points up again just how important the experience is of being touched for all our well-being. Something that's been challenging, isn't it, over this um, pandemic time. Yet it calls us once again, as we experience Christ's healing embrace, to find imaginative ways to let our lives embrace others with that same love. It's called a touching place. Father, help me to live this day to the full, being true to you in every way. Jesus, help me to give myself away to others, being kind to everyone I meet. Spirit, help me to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all I do, that I may be a touching place where your healing love may be known and felt. May the grace of and the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us, now and forevermore. Amen.